There have been a lot of recent reports, including many in the mainstream media, that talk about how companies, even sophisticated companies, are getting compromised through various types of cyber attacks. And usually these attacks at some point involve uh, malicious software or, or malware. And pretty much in those cases, what happens is the malware may be getting uh, surreptitiously installed onto a particular victim system. And then once it's installed on that system, it can use that system as a beachhead to get into other systems that are on a particular organization's network. Okay. And one of the first thoughts that pops into people's heads is, you know, hey, I'm already running antivirus software or anti-malware software. Shouldn't it be catching these threats for me? Now, based on what I'm seeing in the field, there are, or there seem to be a ton of threats that slip by traditional anti-malware approaches. Now, that's not to say that the traditional anti-malware technology is useless or, or dead or anything of that nature. It actually catches a fair bit of stuff, but it's not anywhere close to 100%. And so I prefer to think of, of antivirus software or anti-malware software as a seatbelt rather than as a silver bullet. It's more of a precaution than a panacea, if you will. And you're, pr you're going to be better off, I think, most likely, having it, but it shouldn't be the only thing that you rely on. Okay? So what I wanted to do in this particular video is explain why it is that people seem to be getting infected over and over again, and I'll focus specifically in this first video on the malware author's perspective and specifically what it is we're up against. Uh, so one of the first things I want to point out is that, is that malware authors actually have their own quality assurance procedures. And, and this might be a shock to some of you, and you might be wondering what it is that's unique about the way that malware authors do QA or quality assurance when they develop malware. And so first of all, part of a malware author's quality assurance procedure is actually to run their malware against all the known anti-malware technologies out there. And they only release something if it bypasses all of them up front. And what they typically do is, is they do this typically by, by first procuring uh, copies of all the different technologies out there. So they may have a, a test harness that has all the different copies. And actually, the test harness typically involves running these copies inside of each inside of its own isolated uh, virtual machine instance. So you can think of each of these instances as running a different configuration, where that configuration basically entails running a different copy of a piece of anti-malware technology. And then they'll basically load a copy of any malware they write onto each of these virtual machine instances and determine if the anti-malware technology actually detects that malware. Okay, And if it does detect that malware, or maybe I should say if it does not detect that malware, if it, this malware seems to bypass all the technologies that are out there, the malware authors typically are then very happy and they go ahead and release their malware into the wild. If on the other hand, let's say one of these, one of these anti-malware technologies happens to catch a piece of malware, or maybe more than one catches that malware, what the malware authors then typically do is they modify their malware. And there are tools in place for being able to modify malware. Uh, in fact, there are tools that can do this in a largely automated fashion. One of these tools is something that's known as a packer. Okay, a packer basically will take a piece of binary code or a piece of malware, it's going to make a set of both innocuous changes to the code, changes that don't really affect or materially impact what the code does from a malware perspective, okay? And then they may also encrypt portions of the actual binary contents of the file itself so that it looks different, or at least looks ostensibly different, even though underneath it's probably the same thing. Uh, but on the whole, it's going to look different. In fact, many parts of it will look even random. And they essentially just rinse and repeat this procedure until they have something that can bypass what the existing vendors have to offer. And again, I want to point out this process is largely automated. It's not something that requires a lot of manual effort on the part of the malware authors. Okay. Now, the other related issue that I want to point out is that vendors in general are faced with an exponential growth, an exponential growth in the amount of malware that's out there. And actually, that exponential growth is part and parcel. It's really due to this packer phenomenon. Okay, And ultimately, what's happening is the packers are really just modifying some of the window dressing, some of the uh, non-essential aspects of the binary. But underneath, the threat is actually the same. And so what may happen is you may have 
let's say, you know, a small number of distinct threat families out there, maybe a small number of distinct threats, but each of these threats may have a large number of, of different variants, okay? And malware or anti-malware technologies have a hard time keeping up with this large number of variants because they may not fully realize that these large number of variants are in fact associated with a small number of underlying of underlying binaries. Okay, so the Packer phenomenon is a very powerful one. It's, it's a concept that that malware authors exploit, and it is something that's making it easy for them to get by existing anti-malware technologies. Okay, the other thing I do want to point out, and this is on a related note, is that attackers are also using another packaging technique, which is that they are packaging their threats via what are known as exploit kits. Okay, exploit kits, and exploit kits are basically you can think of them as uh, a turnkey solution, a turnkey solution that will really just take any piece of malware and package an exploit around it so that, that that piece of malware will end up on a system. So for example, you might have a system that will um, have a vulnerability of some sort and then the exploit code will exploit that vulnerability and then in turn drop a malicious payload containing a piece of malware onto the system. And really the main phrase that I want to emphasize here is the phrase uh, turn key. This is the kind of thing that anyone can do. Anybody who is willing to expend the cash or the capital can get their hands on an attack toolkit. So really attack toolkits ultimately, they democratize the process of cybercrime. They make it easy for anyone to get involved. Now I don't want to belabor this point too much because I do have a separate set of videos that talk about web exploit kits in more detail. So if you are interested, I would suggest uh, you check out some of those chalk talks. All right. The last thing to keep in mind is that malware itself is not something that's typically isolated. Oftentimes, uh, malware is part of a broader ecosystem. Okay, and by that I mean you might have, let's say, a, a particular system. Let's say the system gets infected with malware. Uh, one of the first things that'll happen once it gets infected is that this malware will typically pull in other copies of malware onto the system. Okay. So there'll be all these other floating copies of malware out there. Uh, and moreover, it's entirely possible that there was a piece of malware already on the system in the first place that even pulled in this other piece of malware. And so really what you have is this, these relationships between all these files where they are in fact part of a broader ecosystem. And if you really want to detect this malware, if you really want to clean the system up, you've got to handle not just the one piece of malware, but all the other artifacts that are related to it. And again, traditional vendors tend to focus a lot on the on that single detection. They might do a good job of detecting one of these variants. Maybe they'll detect you know, a particular uh, variation of, of this piece of malware, and they may do a good job of detecting it. But there may be all these other artifacts that are still out there and still running on that system. And so the system is going to continue to be in a compromised state. All right, so those are the main problems we are up against. And the next question that should pop into your mind is, why is it that approaches that are out there, that existing vendors have put out there, why are those approaches not able to, or why do they fail at addressing these threats? And I'll describe that in particular in the next video.